Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast, episode 484. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com, our social media handle at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is Critics Pod. We're on YouTube. You can also listen to us on uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. Subscribe to the show, rate and view the show. Uh, we do go live on Monday nights, generally at about 8 central time, 8, 8.30, depending on how much I have my shit together. Uh, <clears throat> that's been the norm lately, if, we're, if we are recording. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you want to watch, that's a good time to check us out on YouTube. Because Bob had to have kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the job, too. I mean, it's a, it's everything is compiling on itself. I don't know if that just happens at 40 generally or what. <laughs> it does. It does. It comes with, they, they, they issue that at 40. They just don't tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just been, life has been taking away from movies. But I did get back to the theater this week, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, before we get there, though, I want to uh, mention our Patreon page at patreon.com slash critics pod. The best way to help support the podcast. Thank you to all of our subscribers. Uh, we also have our T public page at I hate critics dot net. In the upper right hand corner, there is a T public link. Click on that. And you can buy some of our merch or go to T public and search critics pod or Willem Dafoe or Cameron Diaz or everyone's a critic. Uh, we're all over the place there. We need to we need to make a happy birthday Josh t shirt. Yeah, so yeah, it's Josh's <laughs> birthday. Forgot about that one. Uh apparently he just gets an R two D two cake every year from what <laughs> I noticed on Facebook. Uh, is uh, that the right one? Or is it the is other it, row? I don't know. Does that make you does that make you hate cake? <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, despite my appearance, yeah. I'm not a huge cake guy. <laughs> But that definitely doesn't make me go there. Yeah. Well, plus, you need the vegan frosting. It's a whole thing. Oh, not, now it's impossible. You, uh, you got to get the eggs right. You can't have eggs in it. It's a, it's a whole ordeal. Uh, and then the ice cream, you got to get dairy free. It's just, it's not fun for anybody <laughs> unless you're vegan. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and get started with the show. Let's find my share screen. And grab this and share and full screen. Uh, Sean and I both made it back to the theater for the first time in over a year. Yeah, it's been over a year. And we saw Spiral from the Book of Saw. Spiral uh, from the Book of Saw is a continuation of sorts of the Saw franchise with uh, Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson, among others, and directed by Darren Lynn Boozman, who's a longtime Saw director, directed uh, a couple of the Saw sequels. And uh, the story goes that uh, basically this time it's a copycat killer who is uh, using uh, Jigsaw's playbook to... uh, enact a series of a series of murders of police officers. And he's doing so as a way of correcting the behavior of corrupt cops. Uh, Chris Rock is a non-corrupt cop who uh, kind of gets caught up in the center of this as the subject of this, uh, because uh, the jigsaw killer, you know, wants to kill the people around him and he's trying to keep uh, them alive essentially. Uh, but as a younger cop, he turned in a dirty cop who uh, murdered a witness to cover up a police uh, involved killing. And uh, ever since then, he's been considered a rat. Uh, But it also means that this person who is taking up the jigsaw mantle kind of sees him as a, as a potential ally, I guess. So somebody he can uh, take under his wing and teach the ways of jigsaw, perhaps if he can get him to go that way. Um, This isn't a saw movie to me this is uh this is something slightly different because really they they set out to do something similar to saw like this movie gets a lot of credit for being about police corruption and being a horror movie with some ideas about police corruption but really in the end it's not really about that the the moral lessons that are being taught here are very on the nose and not it, it lacks the the philosophical edge that i've that at least i feel i've seen in the in the first seven saw movies 
outside of this one in Jigsaw, I think there was legitimately something there to, that the movies were trying to say, and they had some intention behind them and a genuine philosophy about uh, trying to make people value their life, but also, you know, wanting to punish those who are, uh, who are you know, pissing in the water supply. <laughs> those people who take it upon themselves to make it about themselves as opposed to uh, working together as a collective. Uh, I've always loved and appreciated that about the Saw movies uh, and everybody else pretty much writes it off, but I still, I've got a series of reviews that, that are going up at uh, horror.media of all of the original Saw movies and including this one and Jigsaw. And it, it just reaffirms that for me, this first uh, seven movies really did have a, have a through line that was uh, quite serious, but also a definite philosophy behind them. This one is more of a police procedural that tacks on the ideas and maybe the kind of the milieu of uh, of Jigsaw, but doesn't really get to the heart of it. I don't think this I think much of this movie is a lot of Chris Rock as a cop uh, detective sort of chasing his tail until Jigsaw kind of randomly the Jigsaw copycat randomly reveals itself at the end and and tries to tie it all together. And I, I, I miss the way that the Saw movies used to tie themselves together at the end, that that rising chorus, this almost this wave upon wave of revelation that, that set to this incredible, you know, Saw soundtrack. And uh, as the as the various levels of Jigsaw's insane plan suddenly turn into something that is concrete and meaningful, uh, that always got me at the end. I always loved that at the end of the Saw movies. And this one tries that and, and fails at it pretty miserably, which is kind of surprising considering that, again, Darren Lynn Boozman did this really well a couple of times. Um, I don't think this is a bad movie. I think Chris Rock is really good. Uh, I think he does a great job of balancing his comic persona with the, this more uh, bitter, angry uh, cop persona. And Samuel L. Jackson is just so relaxed and such a just a such a great movie star that even if he is kind of on autopilot, he's still Samuel L. Jackson. He still can hold the center. He holds your attention. He holds the screen. And so there are good things about Spiral. But in the end, it's not it's not quite good enough for me as a Saw movie. Yeah, it's almost a you need to see it twice, but it's not necessarily good enough to see twice. <laughs> uh, because the first time you you can't not think of the Saw movies. Uh and that's all you're comparing it to, you know, just human nature. And I feel like the next time I'll like it a little better I, as a standalone movie. Uh, you know, I, I'm I like the Saw movies not as much as you. I kind of check out after the third one. I think they get a little sloppy after that, or repetitive maybe. Uh, but the first three I think are just fantastic, and, and this is just a good movie, goodish, kind of predictable. Uh, at first, the acting bugged me, but then I was like, "Oh, they're it's a horror movie. They're going for over the top. I gotta just accept that." And once I did, I started to enjoy that. Uh, I like the idea of, you know, it. It's they keep calling it the woke saw movie, which is, <laughs> but they they like you said they don't. I don't know. It's it really isn't. I mean, it is to an extent, but he definitely, it's not all about that. And I think that might be what also kind of prevented it from being a Saw movie. Cause it seemed like Chris Rock was aware that it was too woke. So he wanted to take a step back and therefore it didn't tie together the way the other Saw movies do in a way possible. Uh, and on top of that, like you said, you, the main character is Chris Rock and it follows him. It's a police procedure. Like you, so it, it really is a different tone altogether. O- on top of the fact that you have, you know, Sam Jackson and Chris Rock are more famous than anybody in any of these other <laughs> Saw movies. So right yeah. away you have that distraction. Uh, but, you know, uh, but it's watchable. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the first time back in the theater. I I had a good time watching it. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'd say it's a solid movie. Uh, it's in the Saw world, but it's not a Saw movie. Right. Means. Uh, the the connections to to Jigsaw are very Loose. are very limited, I would say, and, and they don't really hold together because you've got this uh, this copycat killer who takes up the mantle of Jigsaw and starts using his you know style of traps and whatnot, but they don't really establish enough of an emotional or intellectual connection between that uh, killer, especially as after the killer is revealed. To uh, to make that make sense, like why was this why was this guy or this 
this guy. I guess we're you know, giving it away a little bit, but uh, why was this person uh, drawn to the Jigsaw murders? I, I get that what happens in this movie, and you have to infer a lot on this as well. Right. Uh, the cops uh, received this directive after in the wake of the Jigsaw killings and, and the copycats that followed after Jigsaw's death to crack down on crime in a way that was uh, criminal, essentially. They were going above and above and beyond the bounds of the law to do this. And it led to a man being killed uh, who should not have been killed. It was just an innocent guy trying to do the right thing. And seeing that uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, person who becomes the killer, you know, sets about enacting a jigsaw plan, but I just don't buy that that killer would have that inspiration. I just don't because it's not very, it's not well established enough. It's too loose. And that's uh, that's unfortunate for, for the film. Um, you know, this is the woke Saw movie. It's like it's like nobody has seen right. the other Saw movies. They're more woke Saw than Six. This. Saw Six is literally about taking down corrupt insurance companies. Like right. it's all that's what the movie is about. You know, and and nobody pays any attention to Saw Six. Saw Six is really great. Uh, it, it's it's a fascinating film, and it's again it's about insurance companies. People think it's about the traps and about the blood and gore. It is, but it's also about you know universal health care. <laughs> it's about taking the decisions about life and death away from you know algorithms on an insurance computer. Like I I, I think if people would pay attention, you'd realize Saw has been pretty woke for a while. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. it's just it's just this time they happen to be taking on. Uh, or kind of taking on police corruption in a very vague and mishandled way. I, I will say Saw 6, oh, 4 through 7, 6 is my favorite. Uh, and uh, I think it needs to be, like, it's not like Jigsaw picked this guy out. This guy just, right. he's a copycat. So really he has no connection whatsoever. And so to say he's taking over the mantle is not even really fair. Because Jigsaw mm-hmm. has no connection to him. Uh, and then if you look at the killings, they really he doesn't really give you a chance to survive. You yeah, know? And, yeah. And either that or it's just really sloppy filmmaking. But I'm going to go with the fact that no matter what, you would have – there just really was no – a lot of the people decided to make the move fairly early on and were never able to make them – you know, do the horrible thing to get themselves to survive. And right. none of them are able to survive. So, you know, he's definitely not – I mean, you got to – you really got to separate the two and just accept it as a copycat and nothing else. There's a there's a certain form of uh, of optimistic nihilism in what Jigsaw did in letting people have the opportunity to, to survive his traps. He doesn't want to kill these people. He wants them to realize the value of their own life and do something to earn the right to continue to live. And as fucked up as that is, it it's a it's a it's a it's like in professional wrestling when the bad guy has a point. You know, a better a good bad guy in professional wrestling has a point to being to why he's breaking the rules. And Jigsaw has a point to why he's breaking the rules of society and killing people. You, I don't agree with killing people or put, putting them in traps, but I, but I understand the philosophical foundation of what he's going for. And that sort of nihilistic optimism is what makes this series so exciting to me, is that it has a, a very particular philosophy. And, and to, uh, in attempting to continue this in the way it does, it, it divorces itself from oh, that completely yeah no i agree completely and it's a matter but it, but at the same time they don't establish enough because here we are debating is not the right word but discussing what could possibly be you know you know is, is he want does he want him to die is it just sloppy filmmaking what well, you know it's one of the two maybe both uh mm-hmm. but they definitely don't establish you know him it, it, they you try to make him more of a surprise which you know Really, there's two possible people, <laughs> and uh, they're pretty easy to figure out who they would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you do find out, it's not like blow you away. Uh, oh my god, it's yeah. but I don't know. It, it's like I say, if I can watch it without it, without thinking about Saw, without trying to connect anything to it, because there really is no connection other than that Jigsaw existed in this world. You know, that's mm-hmm. the only connection this movie has. Uh, but it's 
nothing else is really established uh, otherwise. And it looks like they're going to try to sequelize it based on the ending. So that was very successful. So uh, there's a good idea here, like setting cop stories in the universe of where Jigsaw was and mm-hmm. still has a an influence and impact. Like that's a, that's an interesting idea. And you know the last uh, the last of the Jigsaw movies, uh, the, the original seven, I think, did leave the door open for an, numerous you know Jigsaw acolytes like a cult that would allow for something like this to continue. But uh, this isn't connected to that in no, any way. Not at all. Uh, I, I think they could still, you know, if they do sequelize it and they spend the time uh, identifying this character and, you know, I mean, you know his motivations, but, you know, I, I guess you could make it a really scary movie, I suppose. I don't know. There, there, it, it, To me, it's not dead in the water. You could make this a decent series. I don't think you could make it as good as Saw, but I think you could make a solid watchable franchise out of this. But I also if anything, at, at the very least, you know, Chris Rock proves that he can can he, he can do stuff like this and be very good at it. And oh, that's yeah. certainly something because, like I said, I bought in on, on him and his performance and his motivations and the decisions that he made seem to make sense. Uh, you know, he doesn't he doesn't act illogically or 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 just plain stupid throughout the movie. He's a he's a good cop who's doing his job. And the times he gets beat, the times he gets fooled, it makes sense why it happened. And even the his relationship right away with the first guy who was killed, right out of the gate, I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, he's friends with that guy? <laughs> uh, but then they, they come back around and explain yeah. it. I, to me, that's a little bit cheap, but they do, so I got to give it to them. At least they did do that. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's watchable, and I definitely think people who like – either police procedurals or horror movies will enjoy this movie uh it is like a, a horror bit, it's a horror movie law and order <laughs> yeah you gotta be ready for but you gotta be able to handle the gore you know it's yeah kind of like the dark side of the ring fans had to watch last week episode <laughs> it's a little different <laughs> uh it is gory uh so let's go ahead and move on to those who wish me dead those Who Wish Me Dead from uh, director Taylor Sheridan, who's known for his work on the screenplay for Hell or High Water and for directing the terrific uh, movie Wind River with uh, Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen. Uh, this time he's working on a kind of an old school 90s style action movie in which uh, Angelina Jolie plays a firefighter, a fire jumper who uh, has kind of a PTSD situation going on. So they've put her in a fire tower. Her job is just basically to look for fire in the, in the forest. Um, she gets drawn into the plot uh, with this uh, boy played by Finn Little, who uh, whose father has uncovered some sort of nefarious information uh, that the government wants to get their hands on. And they're looking to kill anybody who gets in their way uh, with uh, bad guys, Aiden Gillen and Nicholas Holt. Uh, uh, basically killing anybody who see their face uh, in order to uh, try and get to this kid. Uh, the kid ends up finding Angelina Jolie. She takes him in and and uh, keeps him as safe as she can, but they've started a wildfire. And so her PTSD plus a wildfire that is raging out of control towards her location uh, and these two killers on her trail, there's a lot of excitement in this movie. I, was, I genuinely did uh, get enthralled by the action of this. Uh, it was curious to me the number of the amount of time that Angelina Jolie is off screen, like the way that they're treating this as an ensemble. And I'm sorry, but Angelina Jolie is too big a star for an ensemble. I know she just she just stands out too much. You're you're she's so interesting and so good at what she does that when Aiden Gillen is trying to hold the screen, you're going, Where's Angelina Jolie? Where is she? Is she around? Is she in the scene too? Is uh, is she in the background somewhere? Because uh, <laughs> Aiden Gillen, for as, as talented as he is, he, and, and Nicholas Holt, and even John Bernthal, the same. Like as interesting as they all are, they're not Angelina Jolie, and I want to know what she's doing. I want to be in her her story, and we're in, we're in their story for uh, you know a, a large portion of the first and second act, and. It's like I said, a lot of the time I was just going, where's Angelina? Is she, is she this, is she there? Where is she? Uh, <laughs> she's more interesting than the rest of the movie. That's, uh, uh, I guess a blessing and a curse in a way. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think the movie itself, the way it, it works as an ensemble, it's just the fact that she's such a big star. <laughs> you know, it, it's. I don't yeah. think that anybody did anything wrong. It's just you can't. You know, if a few good men only had Jack Nicholson and then a bunch of character actors, or only Tom Cruise, you know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but it, I mean, it does work. It just it's that curse of having a super A list star. I mean, it. You know, Angelina Jolie's just a handful of people that are that big. Right. And uh, that said, she's and it doesn't help hurt that she's a complete badass in this movie. Uh, where I had problems was just like I was mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, my cable was cutting out or maybe this is a YouTube. Maybe the podcasters haven't heard this. I'm having internet <laughs> problems at home. I live in the middle of nowhere, but not quite far enough in the middle of nowhere where I have a co-op that can get me internet. So this for like the first hour was pausing like every 30 seconds, or every two minutes. It was just a constant. <sighs> So unwatchable i don't know why they were after the dad and the kid and you kind of just said it was something broad they don't do they not really go into it they don't really it's a it's a MacGuffin from, okay. from really the beginning of the end it's really just a reason to get them moving they never reveal what the secret is but right. the dad is a forensic accountant who uh, has uncovered a piece of information and when he sees that the uh, that the the attorney general or state's attorney or whoever it was is ha- has his house blown up. He knows that the the killers are coming for him. So him and his son go on the run, and the killers uh, figure out uh, through some luck and context clues which way he's going, and they beat him to it, and they kill him. Uh, the boy gets away and ends up in with Angelina Jolie in her tower, and uh, that's where the story goes from there. Uh, John Bernthal happens to be the boy's uncle. Uh, so they were going to Bernthal's place when the dad got killed and uh, Bernthal and his wife played by Medina Singor, uh go or get captured and they go, you know, they're off trying The bad guys are forcing them, try to help them find right. the kid. And that's your plot. And it's not bad. No, it's not a bad plot. It's, it's, it's a very watchable movie. It's got some really terrific action in it. Angelina Jolie is fucking great in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, like she's a fucking movie star. She can do, just about anything so i am i have no problem uh whatsoever really with her and really not much of a problem with the movie aside from again she's just such a big star and she's so interesting that she overshadows everything else in the movie yeah i mean i don't know i don't think she wants to be as big a star as she no. is and no, that's that, there's only a hand i mean you're like tom cruise uh Brad Pitt. There's very few people that are at that level at this point, and she's kind of been away for a while, and you know she can't escape it. <laughs> it's just going to follow her <laughs> around. Uh, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just obsessed with Angelina Jolie. I don't know. <laughs> no, I just but, I I was feeling it though. Like I just I was just feeling it though. Like everybody else in the movie wasn't nearly as interesting as her. Well, if Mission Impossible didn't have wasn't chasing Tom Cruise around the whole time, and there was a good. <laughs> 40 50 percent of that movie where he's not on screen it's not gonna work and it's the same <laughs> thing here only it, it yeah. mean, but the difference is it is shot properly it's just uh i don't know it, i shouldn't say this doesn't work because it does work it's just she's such i mean she's huge <laughs> this is this isn't exactly a poochie situation like she didn't require them to uh right. when she's off screen you need to talk about it you need to talk about me and make sure everybody knows where i am right <laughs> She didn't do this intentionally. She's she's fucking great. Like she said, she's great in this movie. And I love the little character touches. She does these just little bits where she just reveals herself, whether she's uh, given the kid, you know, she gives the kid a little dating advice just for, you know, because she's trying to keep him calm and, and get him through this situation. Uh, but that's a funny moment. And it also comes after she's just hit her head. So it's like hey, right. and it plays off the, the kid plays off that uh, really well. And, you know, you see her fall from the tower and she's got to get herself back up and i mean she's she's t- she comes off like a fucking badass she and it's awesome ass kicked in this movie uh i mean punched hard over and over yeah. again and i mean she but you know it, it, she carries it like like a stallone character would you know or whatever i mean it was it's that i mean it's worth watching i, I definitely recommend it just not we're at my house go watch it at your house <laughs> it's a better connection uh, right. It is in theaters too, I believe. 
Uh, and really I, I, I want to give a shout out to Medina Singor. Her her character also. She's a survivalist. She's uh, Don Berthold's wife. And uh, I I thought when I saw that it's like oh fuck it's a without remorse moment coming mm-hmm. coming right here. <laughs> he, Terry, he, Taylor Sheridan wrote that script by the way. Oh wow. <laughs> and uh, I was like oh no I can see what's happening here. These two are dead meat. And they turned that a little bit and gave her uh, a, a couple of really great moments that that uh, that were solid enough that. Uh, I only kind of wondered where Angelina Jolie was during those scenes. Well, <laughs> I mean, and when they find John Berndahl, they don't shoot him like they do everybody else, but they do yeah. a good enough job of making you understand why. And that, to me, that's important. A lesser movie yeah. without remorse wouldn't do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, but it's there if you want to see it on HBO Max or in theaters through uh, June, and then it'll be gone. It'll disappear yep. only in theaters at that point. The woman in the window. Ah, uh, yes, this movie's been around for a while now. Uh, this is Amy Adams uh, starring as a uh, psychologist who's dealing with trauma that is cr- that is caused in her. Uh, agoraphobia, which uh, causes her to be afraid to leave her home. Uh, she's visited uh, on a regular basis by her therapist, uh, played by Tracy Letts, who also adapted the screenplays from for this from a very popular book. Uh, and she's estranged from her husband, uh, played by Anthony Mackie and her daughter uh, as well. And uh, she's just living alone in this house, drinking wine and taking pills and kind of generally zoning out on a regular basis uh her main connection to the world is spying on her neighbors uh, a la jimmy jimmy uh, stewart in rear window uh and she kind of builds their lives in her head and she gets new neighbors uh played by uh, gary oldman uh as uh, one of them and, and a, a young boy and uh, a mom or at least someone she thinks is the mom though that's uh, a bit of a twist but uh, julianne moore uh pops up uh in this movie and uh as these new neighbors are settling in, they all take the, the opportunity to come see the woman across the street who's spying on them. And uh, the, she has interactions with each of them. She then sees that there may be some abuse happening from the father to the kid, and she's concerned. Uh, but also, is she actually seeing anything that she's actually seeing because she's you know, drunk and popping pills every day? Uh, and, and there are many other secrets. <laughs> what is it with Hollywood just making Amy Adams look like garbage? Like I know that this character isn't supposed to be uh, somebody who's taking good care of themselves, but honestly, these house, these house dresses they've got her in, (laughs) I'm not trying to be judgmental, but about her attractiveness, she's still very attractive, but I'm saying that this is just not a fun, enjoyable look for anybody. And I can't imagine anybody finding this interesting to watch this character. Um, it's just something about her. Like they did this to her. They let her down this way in, in uh, hillbilly elegy as well, uh, where they think that just basically dressing her down. will try and will maybe dim her talent somehow <laughs> like to make her more relatable to the other actors. I don't know. Cause she's so much better than everybody else. Maybe you do have to dr- like uh, dress her down a little bit. So she doesn't outshine the rest of the cast. <laughs> How do you, outshine- she's let down. I mean, you got Gary Oldman and Julianne Moore. I mean, they're yeah, right they're barely the there. Oh, they're barely in the movie, though. They're barely yeah. there. Never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> they're certainly at her level, but they're barely in the movie. Um, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee's also in the movie, along with Brian Tyree Henry. But it's mostly just uh, just mostly just Amy Adams on her own, and uh, she does really well with this. Directed by. Uh, Joe Wright, who's a, a solid director, he did Atonement and Hannah, so he knows how to direct. But there's a lot of cheats in this movie and a lot of really uh, pulpy stuff that really builds toward a twist that is kind of icky in many ways and a, and a pretty big cheat in many ways as well. Uh, the, the, they really make they really abuse the unreliable narrator uh, in this one to a degree that it, that really stretches it to a point that it can't hold it. And uh, that's unfortunate. There's there are good things about this movie. It's like it's a, it's another one of those you know, really watchable movies. But um, it just in the end, I, I found the whole I found the whole process of getting where they got to be unseemly and not satisfying. And and then the, in the end, I just didn't I just didn't care what happened. I didn't watch it largely because I read bad reviews about it, and I'm glad because the movies I watched I liked quite a bit. 
Uh, I mean, I might check it out eventually. It is on Netflix, uh, and I love Amy Adams. Man, I think she's one of the best out there right now. Uh, that said, she hasn't had that great performance in a while, but COVID. <laughs> so yeah, I don't. Uh, but I, I was excited. The most excited about this until we got into the week and I started watching things. Uh, but we'll see. I think uh, I think Amy Adams needs to get away from Netflix. It's bad news. Two in a row. They're well, bad news. I don't know that she intentionally went to Netflix on this one. <laughs> true, true. The Gin. The Gin. This is a terrific horror movie. This is a movie in which the directors set themselves this impossible challenge. They uh, have one set, this uh, tiny apartment, and their main character is a little boy who can't speak who is on screen the entire time, almost by himself, creating every little piece of horror that happens in this movie. And that is a terrific challenge that they set for themselves and that they pull that challenge off in a really uh, special and interesting way uh, as a testament both to the directing duo of uh, David Charbonnier and Justin Powell and uh, this young actor, um, um, whose name I, uh, is escaping me at the moment, but he's he's a, he's terrific. He he can't speak, like he he's a mute character. He cannot talk, and he's got to carry this entire movie by himself. And I could I could uh, you know go after this as being uh, just a child in danger plot, but I think that they they put enough twists and turns on that to to keep this from being unseemly. Um, uh, the the really it's really just a smartly directed movie. They make really great use of this one location that they have, and these and this one other actor that they have, or two other actors, I guess, that they have in this movie. Uh, one is a guy named Rob Brownstein who plays his dad, who's really, really good. He's this older guy who you assume he's a grandpa, but he's not. And there's there's like a richness to that idea of how a man of this guy's age and stature and his you know his job as a overnight radio dj where he can't be making any money <laughs> the, that idea of of him and this tiny apartment he they communicate so much history just in the casting and and his just little touches in his performance um i also like what they did uh with the mom uh she essentially becomes kind of the the big bad in a way, but she's not actually there as a lot of this centers on what happened to her and, and the boy dealing with the guilt related to what happened to her and how that manifests itself in this thing that he's done where he's made a wish upon this book that he found in their new apartment uh, to call forth the gin or a genie in, in American language. Uh, genie was what we call it, but it's the gin uh, in ancient terms. And uh, he's made a wish to try and get his ability to speak, to, to regain his the ability of speech. And um, he's got to survive the night to to earn this and try and uh, follow the rules of what the book says. And the movie sets out pretty good barriers for what the ghost can do and can't do. And I really appreciated that because so many of these movies use that as a cheat. Uh, the, the 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 bad guy or the or the protagonist will have abilities uh, that only come about because the script you know, needed it to move the plot forward. And they don't do that here. They establish what this entity, this demon, this djinn can do, and they don't allow it to do anything else. And that that I, I found cool. It's also got some, a number of really cool visuals. The visual at the end is, is a striking one, and I, I really dug that. Uh, so I really like this movie. This is a fantastic horror film. Uh, the use of the camera... I mean, the way yeah. they create suspense just by these long ass shots using that one set uh, is just so uh, unnerving. You can't, I don't, you can't keep your eyes off the screen yet. You don't want to look. Uh, none of it's cheap. Uh, even when they explain kind of how the gin works, you know, something starts happening before they get into the explanation. You kind of figure it out there and they mm -hmm. they clarify it and they confirm it when by explaining it later on. Everything about it was just really well done, really neat, really unique. Uh, very, very scary, you know, which a lot of horror movies anymore. If you've seen a movie, it, it's hard to be scary anymore. And this mm -hmm. did a great job of being scary. And then. You know, it doesn't pull any punches. It keeps, you know, at no point can you relax. Uh, and it doesn't rely on simple jump scares either. There are jump scares in this movie, but they're legit. Earned. Like, they are earned. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I, I really loved that. And this movie reminded me a lot of The Vigil, which is another really great horror movie about one guy in one location uh, for an entire night. And uh, similar premise in this, similarly well carried out. Yeah, but I can't recommend it enough. You can rent it right now, I think, on any of your streaming platforms. Uh, and uh, I'll post a link I've got to, in my in my uh, other uh, job on radio. I did a uh, interview with the directors, uh, David Charbonnier and Justin Powell, and talked to them about uh, the challenge that they set for themselves in making this movie and uh, how amazingly cleverly they pulled it off. So... You know, just kind of a hint. I'm uh, just a question. Uh, a lot of those long shot, long shots. Were those legit long shots, or were they kind of pretend long shots? Or did you get into that part of it, or is that they got to wait and listen to your? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really. I tr- I kind of touched on. We talked about the the apartment location a lot, but I didn't really get into the shooting aspect. I was I was kind of more fascinated by the challenge that they set for themselves. But you're right about those shots. They're they're incredible. And they, because of them, and the, I mean, it's all of it's. It relies on every aspect of the movie, from the kid to the to the location of the shot. Everything has to work, or this movie falls apart. Yeah, and it all does. And they, and they nailed the emotional element too. The 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 way they invest you emotionally in in the kid. Uh, not so much that you think like, oh, they're going to kill a child, but, but in, that, in that you understand the emotional underpinnings of why all of this is happening around this kid. Well, yeah, and just to kind of go back on something Sean said, it, the kid made the wish. He's got to survive it within an hour where they're yeah. actively trying to kill him. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it, it's intense. And, yeah. Uh, uh, just and it's a legit know. it's a legit hour i mean it takes that takes the the oh, rest yeah. of the movie because it, it almost feels like a in, in real time almost oh I, I, 15 minutes in of when they start killing him, i'm like he's got getting close right and i look down and it's only 15 minutes and, like, <laughs> and they go though like you said they it's pretty much in real time yeah uh yeah i, I can't recommend it enough uh, if you're a I, horror fan specifically check it out I don't understand a lot of the reviews of this, just dismissing this immediately as just another horror movie. You've got to take into account what the, what the challenge that they set for themselves with this location and this character. And they're, they're telling the story mostly through context clues. That is a really, really great challenge. And, and it takes, it takes a lot of film language to make a movie like this work and, and, and work as smoothly as it does. You, you, like you were talking about before, you learn a lot of this story just from the, from the visual elements of what you're being taught. Yeah. And it's not like your typical horror movie where just ghosts are doing things for no reason. You know, the reasons and, ah, I didn't know it was getting mediocre reviews. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Oh, man, this is one of the better ones I've seen in a long time. Uh, definitely check it out. Scavenger. Scavenger is uh, is something I stepped in and then scraped off my shoe and then decided to watch as a movie. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is an utterly garbage film that uh, I think was initially made in Mexico and then redubbed in English badly, uh, noti- noticeably like in an Ed Wood level of, of dubbing, like that level of bad. I'm going to go ahead and spoil the whole damn thing because this is a piece of garbage and it really doesn't have much of a story to spoil anyway. But I really, this is one of the worst movies ever made and that's not an advertisement for the movie. This is one that is legitimately just unwatchably terrible. Um, the, the, the idea here is that, uh, uh, in, in this uh, post-apocalyptic future, uh, a woman acts as a scavenger who she kills, uh, bad guys. She cuts up their flesh and delivers the flesh to a butcher who then serves it to people who are, are cannibals. Um, she finds out that, uh, the person who murdered her family and kidnapped her sister when she was a kid, um, she finds out that that guy owns a brothel somewhere nearby and that she has the opportunity to gain revenge. She goes to the brothel. She gets dosed. She gets raped for the entirety of the second act by, uh, by first her sister. And then, uh, then a guy pees on her face and then she's raped by the bad guy, uh, before she was finally able to escape and then uh, murder the bad guy. 
Uh, she didn't know it was her sister uh, when they started to um, make out. Uh, and uh, I, I knew. <laughs> I knew not because the movie told me, not because the movie is, is was was seeding that in. It was just so obvious from the economy of characters uh, in the story that, that that obviously was had had to be what it was. This wasn't an old boy thing where they mm-hmm. where they pulled the rug out from under you because these these filmmakers had no intention of actually telling a story or really a capability of telling uh, an actual legitimate story. This is a movie that is just about degradation and, and shock and just being hateful to, to audiences, to anybody who takes a moment to, to look at this. Um, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Roger Reaver talking about uh, the, talking about uh, uh, I spit on your grave here. I mean, just that there's just nothing redeeming about this. The, the, the look of the film is bad. The, 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 Everything this the production design is terrible. The costumes are like Mad Max cosplays from from Comic Con, you know, slapped together from uh, shit they had laying around. Um, there's just nothing remotely appealing or positive or interesting about this garbage movie. And I don't the the only made they made this basically to shock people. They made this to just just to put up a middle finger to people. And I'm not sure. I, I just don't understand what point there this is like uh, i don't know it's like a what is it like it's like just racists who are openly racist to you and you just look at them in shock and it's like how do you get through life at a daily basis just by just being openly hateful to people and that's this movie in a nutshell is just being openly hateful towards people and it's just it's ugly it's nasty it's poorly made and there's you can't watch this movie even ironically to find something to enjoy about it well, yeah, it's, you know, even if I mean, Roger Ebert couldn't make this movie something where we talk about it in 20 years, you right. know, <laughs> uh, you know, when you he basically got people to go watch I Spit in Your Grave and then there was a little bit you were able a discussion was able to be had about that movie. Mm-hmm. This reminds me I didn't watch it, but based on what you're saying and it's going to be even worse than what it reminds me of. But like when we watch Ichi the Killer. And then, like, Eli Ross, a big fan of that, and he goes off and makes Hostile, and it's kind of garbage. Uh, this is like that to the next level. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. clearly they're, they're inspired by stuff that has more substance, but it's also shocking, and they just take all the substance out and just right. leave all the ping in the face, you know, that kind of shit. And yeah. there's nothing to discuss. And at that point, it's just like, I don't care, like, if you got the cool kills or the cool imagery or whatever, that's one thing. But you need something to back no. it up. It can't. This doesn't even have that. I mean, this is this is low rent mystery right. science theater shit. Like this is uh, that's that's the level of what we're dealing with here. Uh, if Eli, I, I I hate Eli Roth's work, but I've never called him talentless. Right. But this this would be if Eli Roth had no talent, right. he would make Scavenger. Absolutely. Uh. Who's the one that made that Last House on the Left remake with, not the actual remake, but the, it was called something else, Chaos or something like that. Ugh, I don't Sylvester remember. Sylvester Stallone's kid. <laughs> uh, that is one of the worst movies ever. Uh, have you seen it? It sounds like you have, based on the way you're I, reacting. I don't. No, I don't <laughs> think. I, I'm not sure if I've seen it or not. I don't remember. All right. That's, it's up there as well next next patreon bonus episode i'm kidding no 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 we're not doing that <laughs> uh but then there's this one the killing of two lovers yes the killing of two lovers this movie is amazing this is uh, my favorite movie of 2021 so far um this is directed by a guy named robert machoyan and stars clayton crawford as the the husband in a marriage that is falling apart uh, he and his wife have separated he's living down the street from her in this small town with his dad and longing to be back home where his you know he's got four kids at home and his wife that he still loves but uh the thing about it is is that there there isn't anything that anyone did She didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. This is just the inertia of two people who fell into a routine and never found a way out of it. And it kind of became soul crushing. And when there's nobody to blame, 
the level of frustration rises to such a degree that that it, it becomes unbearable. And that's the entirety of this movie and the entirety of what's happening in Clayton Crawford's head throughout this movie. He can't be mad at her. She didn't do anything, but he didn't do anything either. So how is he supposed to feel in this situation where his wife is beginning to move on without him? She's started to see somebody and and he... <laughs> He wants to be angry about this, but at the same time, he also agreed to that, that they were both going to try and, you know, other things and maybe try and find a way to move on that way. Even if he meant didn't mean it, it's still something that he agreed to and said, and he can't take it back now. Uh, you also got his daughter who, who blames him for this whole situation. You've got uh, three little boys who don't really understand this situation other than dad's acting a little weird. All of this is communicated in these brilliant, brilliant, deep focus, long lens shots where Clayton Crawford is made to look so small and so insignificant against this you know, this very harsh uh, winter fall background that that isn't co- it's not snow cover, but it, it, it's this kind of barren cold that that you can feel in your bones when you look at it. Uh, and and it's a, it's like being inside his you know his heart his his mind his his feelings uh this barren cold emptiness that he feels uh for for the love of his life then you have just these this incredible scene where he uh, ends up in a confrontation with the new boyfriend and this scene is the best scene of i don't know the last few years for me i was just so amazed the the energy the tension the 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 blood boiling i mean you you if you've ever been in this situation you you feel this on such a level i've been in this situation i had a, and an ex of mine wanted me to try and remain friends and she wanted me to remain friends while she was moving on and getting married to this other guy and he tried to give me a gift and it was as if to me, in my mind, like he was trying to give me something in exchange for giving her up. And it was so awkward and so painful. And I was so mad. And I was I was saying to him, walk away, walk away, walk away. And that's what Clayton Crawford's doing in this amazing scene. He's just he's not looking at the guy. He's just like, just fucking walk away, man. Just walk, just, just walk away right now. And he doesn't. And the scene goes where it goes. This movie is incredible. The opening scene of this movie had me on the edge of my seat. It's just two people lying in bed sleeping. On the soundtrack, you hear this atonal sort of music that sounds like pipes rattling uh, in an old house. And it, this is the soundtrack that's playing in Clayton Crawford's head. You're just in this quick shot to this wide expanding shot that is just Clayton Crawford against an empty background holding a gun over the head of these two people. And it is such an amazing, thrilling, exciting moment just from a visual perspective. It's so, so good and so effective. And it sets this tense tone that does not let up throughout the entirety of this movie. I, I, I could go on about this for days. I love, love this movie. I haven't had the chance to talk about it with anybody. I had to watch it on my phone, uh, as opposed. To, so I, but I didn't. Miss, I mean, I caught everything you said. Uh, this is a phenomenal movie. I, I I can't wait to watch it again. Uh, I, there's I have so many questions. I mean, uh, that opening scene you talked about mm-hmm. it sets the tone, but then they never go back there and you almost feel as frustrated as he does is mm, yeah uh, you know and you were like well is that the end of the movie was that the beginning of the movie was it real i mean he clearly has a gun uh i mean i don't i don't know the answer to any of that mm. uh the last scene i'm assuming was before all the movie took place but i i suppose you could argue it was after i you know i suppose it depends on what the audience wants i don't really know Mm-hmm. Uh, the scene you talked about, I actually had to watch twice because I'm like, what just happened? Because uh, that was, uh, that was, you're right. That probably was the one of the, uh, I mean, I don't know what you call the best, but I mean, it, it doesn't get better than that. So, you yeah. know, it, it's up there with all the other great scenes of all time. 
uh, just a phenomenal scene. And, the, and where it goes, it's just like, oh, my God. Uh, I don't. <sighs> it, it, it's a hell of a movie. And it comes from the guy who was like, and not doesn't come from the guy. The main actor was basically called hard to work with because of lethal weapon. Turns out it wasn't even him. It was Damon Wayans. But uh, that just, that alone shocked me for some stupid TV show. I'd never watched yeah. uh, to find out that this guy was the guy. Now he was definitely carried by the director and the writing, but he did. He held his own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, it's just answers? so damn good. <laughs> are there answers to my questions or is it meant to be like that? in your opinion Uh, without giving anything away like there's some yeah i mean i think i think it's much more i think the ending is is rather concrete and bold considering you know what what your expectations are what the you know what what the expectations of the movie uh sets up for you um it it it's it's a bold way to go and I, i i think it is a concrete ending as it's intended to be and uh, I really loved that. And I, re- I just everything about this movie works for me. This every scene, every shot is so perfectly composed. Uh, I, I, I'm, there's one uh, where where he and his kids are playing in the park. You've got oh, yeah. him and his kids. They're playing with this rocket, and they're in one corner of the screen. And then his daughter is kind of more to the center. But then there's all this space left over on the side, and it's as if that that space in the side is waiting for something to occupy it. And it's going to be whatever happens between him and his daughter is going to occupy that empty portion of the screen and that emptiness getting, Oh, the, the emptiness just reflects like, look at what we're looking at the poster. I mean, you can see that, that all the things on top of him, uh, all that space on top of him is meant to make him look small and it reflects how he feels this, this, uh, toxic sort of male ego that is also coming from somebody who feels like he's a perfectly reasonable guy. And in many ways, he is a perfectly reasonable guy. He's not a bad person, but he's feeling a lot of very desperate, frustrated, impotent emotions. And Robert Matroyan captures that in every frame that he puts Clayne Crawford in. He figures out a way to to exacerbate that feeling. Right before we get to flick chart, let's go into the ending a little bit because I want to know more of what I saw versus you know what actually happened because uh, of my environment. Because uh, that's I'm I'm definitely intrigued, but I don't want to spoil it for the listeners either because it's a must see, especially yeah. if you're the type of person to listen to our podcast. All right, let's move on to our classic, ladies and gentlemen. This is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed classic. Dark Passage. Dark Passage stars uh, um, uh, Bogart and McCall, obviously, uh, together again, as the poster indicates. Uh, the story goes that uh, Bogart's character is a uh, is Vincent Perry. He's a... Uh, a uh, man who's been uh, in jail for a time, accused of having murdered his wife. He claims he's innocent. Uh, he escapes from jail, and we follow him as he makes his way back to San Francisco to try and figure out a way to prove his innocence. Along the way, he gets picked up by Lauren Bacall's character, who uh, claims to have been a, a supporter of his during his trial. Uh, she has a past of her own that uh, in which her father was wrongfully accused, of, in her eyes, of, of killing somebody. And ended up dying in jail. And so she takes his case kind of to heart in her and her own right and sets about trying to help him in any way he can. The problem is that that, uh, director and writer Delmer Daves continuously sets up characters who want to help Bogart in the most convenient way possible, like the most convenient cab driver in history who happens to have who happens to have the the uh, plastic surgeon that'll work in the middle of the night for 200 bucks to give him a new face or the <laughs> just the these convenient characters that uh, that work out well, Lauren Bacall's character is really in many ways a very convenient character I'm sure the the the, the amount of stretch that you have to do to to make her character work Bacall pulls it off because she's very convincing but uh, you have to really love the two of them. And this is definitely on the weaker side of the Bogart McCall uh, 
team ups for sure. Um, the big the thing that most people might know about this movie, and it's been referenced in uh, in other films, uh, is the fact that for the first hour you don't actually see Bogart's face; you hear his voice. But for the full hour, you're you're for the first say forty five minutes, you're actually just hearing his voice from behind the camera. And the camera is essentially a stand-in for Bogart's character. And you see everything from that perspective. Then he has surgery and and you can see him wrapped in bandages, but you can't you still can't see Bogart's face until about an hour in when they take the bandages off and reveal his new face is Bogart. Um, that's a that's an interesting you know film filmic choice. It's an interesting choice by a director to to do, and it's pulled off in a in a charming way uh that that has gone down in history and been used to uh kind of bring bogart back to life in the in the 80s uh, i think it was an uh, episode of tales from the crypt i think it was <clears throat> uh but it's been referred to in, in other ways um i <laughs> i i'm disappointed in this movie just because again convenient cab driver <laughs> it's just such a weak such a weak thing uh there's just no way uh, that that works, and then the 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 resolution to it all uh, is unearned, and it doesn't really work out. Uh, they they needed something more effective than what they had in terms of the actual killer and why that actual killer does what they do. Uh, so it's definitely a weaker effort. But I don't. I totally blame Dumber Daves, the the writer and director, and not Bogart and McCall because they're incredible. I mean, they're just the chemistry is off the charts. They're uh, they're both just these magnetic, charismatic performers that make this movie a very easy to watch movie. But uh, in the in the end, it's it's the most disappointing uh, classic of the Bogart and Bacall team ups. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add. It's it's yeah. if the movie existed today, it would work. You know, because they would just tons of convenient movies that. Gerard Butler start in or whatever that people love. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And this is better than that. But I mean, it's that kind of, it's a very simple, convenient. All the characters are too close to each other, even though there's no reason for them to be. Uh, and it, I wasn't, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's the worst movie I've seen this week, which <laughs> I feel <laughs> it's weird to say a Chris Rock movie might be better. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm that's largely due to just the fact that it's more modern and easier for me to get through, I think, but I, I, I wasn't really a fan. Uh, so it, yeah, <laughs> there's just so much, there's so many poor choices, like, uh, what they do with Agnes Moorhead's character, uh, having uh, why she was in, how did she and Lord McCall meet? How did they end up right. uh, becoming friends? And I mean, cause they're on opposite sides of the trial that Bogart was in and McCall's character was not related to the At trial all. in any way. Yeah. She was just, she an was. Ob- yeah, she was an observer uh, and she somehow ended up uh, involved in all the lives of the people surrounding uh, Bogart's character. And that really sounds like a far more interesting movie <laughs> when you get down to it is her going to the trial every day and involving herself then in this case. And, uh, you know, maybe trying to figure out a way to solve it and save his life from that perspective. Uh, they they kind of went with the less interesting story. Well, and the thing that we talked about a lot with our classics, especially the older ones are, you know how they had to be more creative back you know a long time ago to make things work and to make it make sense and here they it's it's not creativity it's throwing shit together and hoping it sticks and and basically relying on the chemistry of bogart and mccall and that's really all this movie is Mm -hmm. all right 30 years ago what about bob came out what about bob starring bill murray and richard dreyfus uh murray plays a guy who's seeing a psychiatrist played by Richard Dreyfus, and he crosses all the various uh, boundaries there are of the uh, client and patient. Uh, he shows up at his home. He calls him all the time. He just generally annoys the hell out of him. And the problem with that is, is that Richard Dreyfus isn't likable enough for us to, to be upset with Bob and Bill Murray's too annoying for me to care about Bob. So I end up, just being seriously annoyed and not caring about either one of these characters. Murray's not particularly funny here. He's a, he's a dork. He's, he's an annoying jerk uh, who doesn't realize he's an annoying jerk. He doesn't really say anything funny. Um, perhaps I'm just looking for that, you know, classic Mill Bill Murray quick change guy, you know, who's always uh, ahead of the game and you know, kind of a bugs bunny. And that's not 
him in this movie. He's playing and he, he does deliver the character that they're asking for. It's just not a particularly appealing or, or funny character. And then you have Dreyfus, who's just all just he could he want to be in this movie less? I mean, he seems like he's just he's just completely over the top and belting everything to the back of the room out of sheer boredom, trying to to, to force himself into having so, some life and energy in this. And it's just really it's really terrible. This is a really bad movie. Yeah, everybody loves it except for me uh, and, <laughs> and now me. Sean. Uh, every year since 1991, I've had a teacher. What about Bob? Have you seen this movie? Blah, blah, blah. I, I uh, don't like it's. I, I just don't like this movie uh, for a number of reasons. Even if I'd never seen it, I wouldn't like this movie because of the whole <laughs> having the name Bob. It already sucks as a name to begin with. Then you got to have this movie <laughs> to go with you. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't like it. Uh, and I've never seen Mannequin 2 on the move. <laughs> Mannequin 2 on the move. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> this movie is terrible, but it's terrible in a fun sort of way. Um, William Ragsdale takes up the role of uh, that. Not, not the same role, I guess that it, it's the same function as the character from the first movie. And Christy Swanson this time is the, is the mannequin or, or is she a statue? It, 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 she's an ancient statue from ancient times who is awakened when she has this magic amulet on and uh, comes to life inside of a mall and go crazy and stuff happens. And Terry Kaiser dies falling from a balloon and shattering because he gets turned into a, a mannequin or statue. It's, it's so bad, but it did it, it, on the very, on the very least it's bad in that way. That is, that is kind of entertaining to make fun of. Um, <laughs> uh the, and I can say that because the the guys at, at How Did This Get Made really did that. They made a very good episode, a very funny episode about <laughs> about this movie. And I care that really makes me appreciate this movie so much because they made it so funny. Uh, just thinking about them watching the movie is much better than the movie itself. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's our show. Uh, next week we've got uh, Army of the Dead. Hopefully, it's not as bad as the match. Uh, Amityville Poltergeist, Drunk Bus, is it the Dry, and Blast. Yes, the Dry and Blast Beat. Our classic's going to be White Zombie, uh, and from 1991. Probably the most interested I've been in 91 in a while. Just to see if these movies hold up. Backdraft, I feel like it won't. Hudson Hawk, I already know, sucks. <laughs> yeah. Thelma and Louise, I'm wondering. Because uh, that's supposed to be one of the best. I got a the good year. feeling about that one. I've read a lot about that movie, um, and I still I feel like it'll hold up. I'm looking forward to watching it again, though. Then there's Only the Lonely Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. Those are two different movies I said poorly together. Sorry. Only the Lonely is one movie, and Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken is the other movie. And uh, Only the Lonely is uh, John Candy, and uh, the other one is about a horse. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'm watching Backdraft with Tom and Louise <laughs> and Hope in there. Uh, yeah. I mean, Backdraft has to be. Hopefully, it's fun, dumb. I mean, you go, we go. They, he, they know it's a bad movie. Right. Uh, we'll see. We haven't had much luck with Ron Howard lately, so. Yeah, that is true. Uh, but uh, before we go, I want to tell you to go to patreon.com slash critics pod help support the podcast or go to I hate critics.net and click on our T public link to get yourself some Patreon or uh, some podcast merch. A chicken little teen wolf. Teen wolf. Chicken little's forgettable. At least I remember teen wolf. Yeah. Game of Death, Last Action Hero. Game of Death, but I don't hate Last Action Hero. I haven't seen either. Uh, Animal House, Aliens. Uh, two two desperately overrated movies. Animal House. Really? I think. I, yeah. Yeah i I really don't like Aliens that much. I'm just not going to watch it again and I'll, I'll I'll pass by animal house and kind of catch a few minutes of that whenever it's on. Yeah. Oceans eight need for speed. 
Ocean's Eight. Agreed. The Wolverine Secret Window. Secret Window. Secretly a great movie. <laughs> Here's a fun one. Terminator Salvation, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows. Which one sucks less? Um, Terminator. I haven't seen either one, so you get to make that call. (laughs) Team America World Police, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, it's Cuckoo's Nest all the way. One of the best movies of all time. Sucker Punch, Now You See Me. Now You See Me. I agree. I really like Now You See Me. I do, too. Drive, The Godfather Part 2. It's Godfather Part 2, but Drive is a great movie. Yes, completely. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Hudsucker Proxy. Close Encounters. Hudsucker is kind of on the lower end of Coen Brothers movies. I've never seen it. (coughs) The Last of the Mohicans, The Bodyguard. (laughs) Uh, Which one's shorter? I'm probably The Bodyguard. (laughs) The last of the Mohicans, just everything that Daniel Day Lewis does feels like homework. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you're starting to slowly f- follow. I'm, I'm bleeding off on you a little bit on my hate of Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> you're not hating him, but you're definitely no. not jumping for him. I, I still love Phantom, Phantom Thread. <laughs> yeah, and I love the fact that that's not Whitney Houston on the cover. <laughs> Uh, the Rundown, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Talented Mr. Ripley. The I, uh, I got interviewed by, by, by Vocal, uh, the, com- the company I write for online, and I got to tell the story about, uh, about seeing The Talented Mr. Ripley and how it uh, essentially changed my life and changed the way I see movies. So, yeah, I'm going to kind of pick that one when it comes up. <laughs> The Cider House Rules, Star Trek, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. Star Trek 3, fuck the Cider House Rules so hard. Okay. Time Bandits, 7 Pounds. Time Bandits. I really hate 7 Pounds. Uh, Sam? <laughs> I've not Hood. seen okay. I've not seen some. I heard good things about it. It's about sommeliers and wine. Oh. I haven't seen it though. Rocky Robin Hood. <laughs> Rocky. Rocky. You Easy don't, choice. You don't like middle aged Robin Hood? <laughs> <laughs> Blair Witch Project Half Baked. Blair Witch. I don't hate half baked. Yeah. Transformers, Dark of the Moon, and Glorious Bastards. Yeah, it's Inglorious Bastards. Iron Man. That's a cartoon. cartoon. Weird science. This means war. Weird science. This means war should have been so much better than it is. Yeah. With that cast. Get them to the Greek public enemies. I like both of those movies a lot. Um, Obviously, I think that public enemies is a better movie, but get them to the Greek is the one I'm watching. So. I just, I love Get Him to the Greek. That movie makes me laugh. Yeah, I feel like I like Public Enemies, but it's not good enough. I don't know. It's yeah. over long a little bit. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Citizen Kane. It's Kane, but uh, Mr. Smith is also an amazing film. Yeah. Jupiter Ascending, <laughs> Shark Tale. <laughs> Oh, let's see. I mean, I ironically love laughing at Jupiter Ascending, so I, I'm going to pick that one because Shark Tale, Shark Tale really sucks. I thought you just, for Josh's birthday, we're going to just really say <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> I'm taking Shark Tale. Uh, a Few Good Men, Super Troopers. A Few Good Men. They heard us talking about it. That, I gotta get, that was a great point you made about when we were talking about uh, about those who wish me dead, and you talked about, you mentioned... If, if it was only Nicholson or only Cruz, that was a hell of a good point about the underlining what I said about Jolie. Thank you. <laughs> 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 wow. Let's feel like it should be one movie. Blue Velvet and American Tale. <laughs> oh, man. I kind of like American Tale and I don't like Blue Velvet, but at the same time, Blue Velvet isn't a bad movie it's a very well accomplished for what it is and 
I don't remember enough of American Tale, so Blue Velvet. I mean, I'm in the same boat. It's like American Tale is kind of the cartoon that I kind of the first one I remember and that stupid song that uh, I <laughs> somewhere loved, out there I loved forever. <laughs> until I didn't. <laughs> but then I don't know. I just feel like I have to take Blue Velvet. <laughs> You know, we're both underneath the same blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> lethal Weapon 2, Quiz Show. Uh, quiz Show for me. I, I like Lethal Weapon 2, but Quiz Show is an underrated film. I don't think people enough people talk about how good it is. I haven't actually seen it, so I'll let you have it. There's a lot of those late 90 movies that I missed. <laughs> uh, 50-50, Invitation to the Dance. I haven't seen Invitation to the Dance. Fifty fifty home alone three. Fifty fifty. Ink Awakenings. I don't know Ink. Neither do I. Insignia. I don't know that one either. Neither do I. Insomnia Awakenings. <sighs> I think Which, you're Robin Williams. Um man. De Niro or Pacino. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go Pacino on this one. Insomnia is a really great movie. I like Awakenings, but I mean, Insomnia, like I said, Awakenings is one of the best movies of, of 90, but Insomnia is one of the best movies of 2002. I haven't seen it, so I'm just going to go with you. I mean, I've seen it, but I haven't seen it in a long time. I remember liking it, but I, I need to revisit it. Cocktail, Alien Resurrection. Cocktail. Law Trek? Do you know what that Lattrec. is? Latrec. I have not seen it. Yeah, it's about the artist, I believe. Toulouse Latrec. <laughs> Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, Billy Madison. <laughs> I actually talk about uh, Sandler in my review of Scavenger about how his movies I hate his movies but he's not actively hate hateful toward his audience so he's better than scavenger um, <laughs> uh, Billy Madison it's weird I mean there's definitely an I don't know if there's an audience for scavengers but there's an audience for like bad campy horror movies like they that's the kind of art they like and I don't I mean I guess I shouldn't not get it I mean I like heavy metal, so I suppose it's similar to that, especially when you get to the more extreme stuff. People just tend to like random things. I, that Dark Side of the Ring episode where they did the death matches, I definitely don't ever want to see that. But <laughs> I, I just don't get like loving campy horror <laughs> as like the number one art form of all time movie-wise, <laughs> but that definitely exists, and it's weird for mm-hmm. me. And I, but I'm assuming Scavengers doesn't fall anywhere near that even. No, no, it's, it doesn't. It, it's it's not it's not even a movie. All right, last ones and all. Ask my question about the killing of two lovers. Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Expendables. Raiders. So we're gonna go into the spoiler alert for uh, the killing of two lovers. Uh, so if you. Go ahead and turn it off now if you don't want to know, <laughs> if you haven't seen it already. Uh, but uh, five, four, three, two, one. All right, turn it off. Uh, so the end, the new boyfriend beats the shit out of him, sucker punches yeah. him. He drives right. off. Uh, he's He falls out of his car. She comes running after him. He's firing a gun. Does he, something happened when he fired the gun or... <laughs> Did I miss something there? He he doesn't hit anybody. Okay. Uh, and he, wake, he, he comes to realizing that he was actually shooting at her and not uh, the boyfriend. Uh, she had chased after him uh, right. in her car and caught up with him. And, and he'd taken a couple shots in her direction, but thankfully he missed her. And she ran over and uh, picked him up and helped him home. And uh, we cut to a scene uh, several weeks or months later and they're back together and they're trying to work it out and uh, trying to overcome their their problems uh, but the, it's also 
it's not necessarily a happy ending because they're also kind of back to this sort of mundane routine that they right. were in before the same thing that had driven them apart before this, you know, this mundane existence of buying a washer together <laughs> and whether or not they want one that hooks up to the internet. Um, you know, these kind of boring questions that married couples have to ask each other, but are not exactly the, what makes a, a great life together. And uh, that's, that's what's so impressive about this movie. The title, The Killing of Two Lovers, isn't an actual murder. It's right. the it's this the killing of their of their love for each other and and for potentially her love of this other man. That's uh, what's being killed here. And uh, that is such a bold idea that it that to, to introduce a title that implicates us in in a violent ending um, and then not deliver that violent ending is just another wonderful trick of this movie and that was i guess where to defend my viewership uh, was where i was like is this before this movie took place or is it after now what you're saying it makes sense that it was after uh but you know he did pull a gun on her in bed and then shot at her <laughs> so, uh she doesn't necessarily know that yeah any he got that. away with them not knowing and that's such a great opening scene again where he crawls out the window and you think oh my god he just murdered two people. <laughs> what happens now? And that wasn't what happened. And I was like, oh, my God. Wow. Bold choice. Where are we going? <laughs> the crazy thing for me is, you know, you're talking about the mundane existence. And uh, after going through all that, you know, because you're you're living it through with him. Yeah. To me, it was just like, you know, and maybe it's just because I'm married and, not, you know, you put yourself in the scenario and then you, I guess when you're married, if you really want it to work, you have to enjoy the mundane shit. Uh, and it seemed that was kind of more what I was, I mean, clearly I'm wrong because of the name of the movie. Uh, but I, as a viewer, I was just kind of more enjoying the fact that they were doing the mundane shit, like shoot, shopping for a washer and dryer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was almost like a, you know, a letting a load off. But then you're right. If you really, what they're really going for is even more dark. I don't know. It's a fantastic movie. Everybody should go see it. Yeah. All right. I feel a little better because I wasn't totally off. 